For nearly 300 years, they ruled the largest continuous land empire in history. Twice the size of Caesar's Roman Empire. Longer lasting than Napoleon's. As world shaking as Alexander the Great's. They are the Mongols. The fury that rolls like a storm out of the steppes. In the early 13th century, the Mongols pioneer a style of warfare unparalleled in cunning and cruelty. And so revolutionary, it still inspires military strategists today. Sweeping east and west, destroying everything in their path, they shatter the old world order and carve a new course of history. It is the end of the 12th century. As Europe lies mired in the Dark Ages, two cultures set the standard for human civilization. The Islamic states in Persia and Central Asia. And far away to the east, a trio of fabulous kingdoms in China. Between these stretch vast, inhospitable grasslands, the Eurasian steppes. Although the steppes are formidable, they are not empty. Nomadic tribes, the Tatars, Mongols, and others, eke out a grim life. These are some of the coldest places on Earth in Mongolia. Temperatures 90 degrees below zero. So, for much of the year, they're fighting nature. It's a life with no, no margin of safety in it. In 1175, the Tatars renew an old feud with the Mongols. These two tribes, so similar in lifestyle and belief, are bitterly divided by ancient rivalries, a never-ending cycle of alliance, treachery, and revenge. Caught up in their own struggles, they ignore their common enemy, the rich and powerful Jin of northern China. The Jin Dynasty, their policy towards Mongolia was one really of divide and conquer. And the Jin would employ the Tatars on raids against uh, other nomadic groups, tribes, khanates that grew too large and too threatening. The Jin wisely perceived that as long as the people of the steppes are focused on each other, they won't trouble them. It is in this time of upheaval that great Mongol conqueror Genghis Khan arises in the 12th century. He does so not from a family of kings or princes, but as a fatherless boy facing death with his family on the barren steppes. Genghis Khan's given name is Timujin, Mongolian for iron worker. It's fitting. His life will demand an iron will. In 1175, when he is barely nine years old, his father, leader of the clan, is poisoned by the Tatars. Genghis Khan's father had been an up-and-coming tribal chieftain. Uh, perhaps if he'd lived, he might have become the next uh, uh, Khan of the Mongols. But as soon as he was poisoned, the widows of the previous Khan led the Mongols to desert the widows of Jisagi, Genghis's father. And the result was that Genghis Khan was left on the steppe alone with his mother. Abandoned with her children, Timujin's mother gives him a simple charge. Seek revenge. He had grown up we can presume, with this strong sense of mission. He was the son of one of the leading chieftains, one who had won victories in war when other chiefs had been defeated. And he had been abandoned, and that created a really strong sense of bitterness, a strong sense that the world doesn't work the way it should. For 30 grueling years, Timujin fights to unite his clan and gain the title of Khan, great leader. He learns to trust those proven loyal in battle, 
and he remains suspicious of all others. By the age of 40, he has grown to be a gifted chieftain. We're looking at a man like Alexander, like Hitler, I have to say, with immense charisma, who made people follow him by the strength of his personality. Having united his tribe in 1196, Timogen turns to the second task. Vengeance on the Tatars. The tactics were pretty much entirely uh, uh, horse, horse tactics. And um, they incorporate all of the things that we would, we would normally expect. Techniques learned in the hunt, for example, uh, would often be employed in, in tactically in, in, uh, in battles. The feigned retreat, uh, drawing your enemy in, in and encircling your enemy, uh, enveloping the enemy. Uh, there, were, there were elements of their tactics that are so reminiscent of, the, uh, reminiscent of the Blitzkrieg. What I do see, new in the case of Temuchin Chengiz Khan, is his reorganization of society. That has to be reckoned among the most important, not only social uh, innovations, but military innovations, which, in which he takes the old Central Asian Mongolian tribal structure and refashions it in, its, in his own image in a way, breaking the old tribal loyalties, but maintaining uh, a kind, the, the kind of power of this uh, tribal cavalry. As far as we can tell, in virtually every battle they fought, in every battle they won, the Mongols were substantially outnumbered by their enemies. Um, but they were much more mobile because they had so many horses. And they were able to operate, it seems, in small tactical teams. No more than a few score at, at most. So the first thing you'd see if you were fighting the Mongols is they would seem to be everywhere. Oftentimes they would come at you in a single file and suddenly they would just disperse and suddenly they'd be all around you. That was really disturbing. The Mongols' combination of finely honed horsemanship and tactical strategy overwhelms their enemies. They are virtually wiped from the face of the earth in just two years. Only their name will live on. And they are but the first of many, for Timogen is molding his army into the finest light cavalry the world has ever seen. And he does take revenge on the people who had inflicted so much hardship on, on his family, uh, his larger family, and on his immediate family, namely the Tatars, who, when he finally defeats them, he, uh, the, as the story goes, he has ev everyone uh, taller than the axle of a wagon uh, executed. So he, he decimates, he destroys this particular tribe. The ambitious chieftain is a religious man. He reveres the natural hierarchy he sees around him. The ground is sacred, the rivers are sacred, but above all is heaven, the protector of the nomads. For Timogen, human affairs should mirror this hierarchy, and one man must stand above all others. Timogen has no doubts that fate has chosen him to lead. So he believed on the one hand that he was of a, of a heavenly destined lineage. Why? Because when you won victory in battle, it was something decided by heaven, by God, by this Mohatengar, eternal heaven, or eternal God, which, the, which Genghis Khan firmly believed was in charge of all sort of all victories in battle and all uh, successes and failures uh, uh, in this world. In 1206, a ruler's council of steppe tribes acclaims Timogen as universal leader, or Genghis Khan. He now stands poised to conquer the rest of the world and seal his reputation as the bloodiest of all barbarians. Driven to avenge his father's murder, and empowered by a sense of his own destiny, in 1206, Genghis Khan rises from obscurity to the brink of world domination. He is the ultimate leader, the Khan, of all the restless and nomadic tribes of the steppes. His people live a difficult life in a brutal environment. This is a society that is perpetually on the move, so they're ready to bundle up shop in no time at all so 
What does that say about how these people live? The tents they live in? They have a cane uh, framework and felts are tied or sewn onto these individual cane panels and they can be set up inside 15 minutes and dismantled in the same sort of time. So the inside of yurts was incredibly dark and smoky because they only had a hole at the top and a hole at the doorway. And the doorway always faced south because the Mongols were superstitious that, that good news came from the south. You had felts on the floor, felts on the walls, so dark, 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 and then everything permeated with smoke. What did they burn? There's no wood on the step, so it's dung. So it's smoke that's permeated with animal smell as well. This hard scrabble existence shaped Genghis Khan's character, and his mother's words of vengeance provided his mission. Points the, the very important role that Mongolian women uh, played and still do play in uh, in Mongolian society, and and that's a very important sort of formative. Uh, um, episode in his whole life um, because he becomes very attached to to women to his wife uh, to his mother um, they figure very prominently both figure very prominently later on when he distributes uh, his territory and his soldiers among these people both women receive shares so um, th that's that's quite an important thing she really holds the family and she's the cement of the family by the year 1206 Genghis Khan's power over the steppes is unchallenged now he directs his vengeance on the wealthy and arrogant Jin of China. In 1211, the Mongols move to invade China. The enormous ancient nation sees them as scruffy upstarts out to stir up a little trouble. The Chinese have no idea what they are about to face. Down in South China, the Song Dynasty, the ethnic Chinese in, so in South China, often looked on the Mongols as possible allies. And they developed a very interesting view of the Mongols, that the Mongols were these very crude, barbaric, savage people, but they were uncorrupted, unspoiled. Within hours of their initial meeting, the Mongol troops annihilate a much larger Chinese force. The nomads learn fast. They copy Chinese siege technology to breach their city walls. They become the embodiment of terror. And then they start beating their drums. And these drums are carried by four people on ropes. And the mere sound of them drove people mad with fear. They brought with them the prisoners from the previous city that they captured and pushed them into the moat so that they could go over them, over the dead bodies at the city walls. And then they would slaughter every living thing, the very cats and the dogs. In 1215, they lay waste to the capital of northern China, Chengdu, present-day Beijing. But just as victory seems within reach, news arrives that trouble is brewing in the Mongolian homeland. The news reaches Genghis Khan across a thousand miles of territory, carried by a surprising system of communication that eventually will connect the entire Mongol Empire. They developed very early on a system known as the Yam, which was basically the Pony Express. And two messengers would be sent out with special badges that they wore around their waist showing that they were official emissaries of the government and horses would be provided at post stations every 25 miles for these two to ride off carrying in their hands literally rolls with messages on them in 1218 the yam riders bring genghis khan the news that kuchlug the Khan of the Naaman clan is fomenting a rebellion among other disgruntled tribesmen. Genghis Khan's hard-won order is being threatened by disloyalty from his own people. This cannot be tolerated. In search of the rebels, Genghis Khan launches a crusade that takes him far from his business in China. 
As they pursue the rebels west into Muslim lands, the Mongols annex one kingdom after another. Before crossing into each new territory, Genghis Khan gives the local ruler the option to give up the conspirators and surrender peacefully. But if the ruler resists, Genghis Khan warns he will show no mercy. He writes one chieftain, the disaster will reach you too. Genghis Khan's campaign of vengeance has swelled his empire till it touches the borders of the ancient kingdom of Khwarazm in present-day Uzbekistan. Though Khwarazm is an attractive target, Genghis Khan goes no farther. He has learned something new. I think that the key moment in the career of Genghis Khan that lifted him from being a territorial chieftain in Outer Mongolia, and it's not accident that Outer Mongolia means the boonies, it means the back of beyond, that moved him from that to a player on the world stage, was when he began to realize that his territories were on the Silk Road and that he could change the fortunes of his people by trade. And so he sent a series of embassies to his nearest neighbor, the Sultan Muhammad, who was the ruler of the Eastern Islamic world. And those embassies were finally followed by a caravan of 1,500 camels. And I think that what happened there was that this particular camel caravan was so rich that it tickled the, the greed of the Muslim governor of the frontier post concerned at Otrar, and he simply seized it. This governor of this town, he saw this Mongol embassy uh, of, of, of merchants coming, basically a trade mission come. He saw all the kinds of things that were in there, and he asked the uh, Sultan Muhammad, uh, what should I do with them? He was told. Uh, implied they're spies these people these mongol envoys are spies what should i do with them can i can i massacre them and sultan muhammad said yes and they were undeterred genghis khan sends a second envoy only to have him seized his beard is shaved off in the street as an act of humiliation before he is sent back The caravan of gifts, of course, is not returned. Genghis Khan's final dispatch to Sultan Mohammed is simple and grim. You have chosen war, he writes. And it was that event, that greed, that breaking of the laws of interchange of ambassadors, of allowing merchants free run across frontiers, that caused the Mongol catastrophe, the catastrophe which, as one Russian chronicle says, left no eye open to weep for the dead. They came, they sapped, they plundered, they burnt, they slaughtered, they departed. Now, this is an utter disaster for the civilized world, and it had that curious small trigger. As his soldiers prepare for war in 1219, Genghis Khan is unconcerned. That will happen, he says, which will happen. And what is to be, we know not. Only God knows. In carrying out God's heavenly plan, the Khan will teach his enemies a terrible lesson and continue a conquest that will destroy all that stands before him including the wealth and knowledge of an entire civilization. Genghis Khan has unified the nomadic Mongols, subdued the wealthy Chinese, and now, in 1219, stands perched to take on Sultan Mohammed, the ruler of the Khwarazam Empire of Central Asia. Genghis Khan is a man driven by revenge. In Alchuk, the Sultan's governor has flagrantly humiliated a Mongolian diplomatic envoy, an abuse that cannot stand. A 
But the Sultan's stronghold, Samarkand, is defended by an army much larger than Genghis Khan's own. To even the odds, the Khan turns to tools that have served him well in the past. Mobility and surprise. Much more interesting about this particular campaign is the fact that Genghis Khan divided his army in the face of a superior opponent. This is tactics that we associate again with people like Robert E. Lee or with, uh, with uh, Blitzkrieg and, and, uh, during World War II. Uh, the purpose being, again, uh, to penetrate the, uh, the enemy's front and to create confusion and diversion and so on in the rear to be able then to turn back and take these places. So I find that to be a, 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 a very significant part of, of what he does. Genghis Khan's first blow comes at the border town of Utrar in 1219. After a five-month siege, the Mongols burst through the defenses and lay waste to everyone and everything in their path. There is no limit to their cruelty. Why were the Mongols so cruel? It's, it's a difficult question. And no one really knows the explanation. But the fact of it, I think, can't be doubted. That these were people who did not wage war in the ordinary way. A special fate is assigned to the greedy governor in Alchuk. He discovers firsthand the meaning of the old Mongolian proverb, return what people give to you. Dragged from his hiding place in the citadel, he is held down while molten silver is poured into his ears and eyes. In February 1220, Genghis Khan plots a three-pronged attack, unrivaled in cunning and malice. First, Two columns of Mongols strike Khwarazam from opposing directions, east and west. Their main goal? To lull Mohammed into thinking that these trifling attacks are the Mongols' best shot. Medieval armies in Europe and the Middle East had a very strong idea that retreating in the face of the enemy was humiliating. And so they really couldn't do it. And the other reason they couldn't do it was because, from the general's point of view, once you start retreating, everybody would think you've lost and suddenly you would lose control of your army. Everybody would start running away. Oh, we've lost. We're running away. The Mongols would retreat. Then suddenly, as they're retreating, they'd suddenly break up, start going around again, and start shooting at you again. That was very disorienting for, um, uh, for many armies. The constant hail of arrows that would be falling, that was uh, a disorienting thing. Diverted by the Mongols' feints and skirmishes, Sultan Mohammed strings out his forces along hundreds of miles of farmland and river valleys south of Samarkand. But far away to the north, Genghis Khan prepares for the main assault. Genghis Khan carefully seeks out the smugglers and bandits who know the secret water holes and camel routes in the desert of Kazayokum. These will be his guides. They will lead his army over 300 miles of punishing desert sands, a back door to the Sultan's kingdom. In March 1220, Genghis Khan and his army emerges from what the Sultan believed was an impenetrable desert, like demons from his worst nightmare. In one of the greatest strategic rearguard attacks in the history of warfare, Proud Samarkand falls in just 10 days. Sultan Mohammed shows his true colors, fleeing for his life from one city to the next. Like hunters pursuing a fox, the great Mongol generals are given 20,000 men and told to crush any town that shelters the fugitive Sultan as they relentlessly track him down and kill him. So it was not just a matter of beating an army in the field, but eradicating the power of a country to ground zero so that there could be no recovery. So they sowed salt in the fields. They 
destroyed the wells, they flooded the cities, they cut the canals, they chopped down the orchards, as if there were no tomorrow. The Mongols' monstrous rampage devastates magnificent Persian cities like Balkh and Herat. Genghis Khan is not concerned. They couldn't care less. So the destruction that they visited on the Eastern Islamic world has lasted to this day. The ruins of once great cities still lay scattered across Persia like ghost towns. With the annexation of Khwarazm, Genghis Khan's empire reaches from the Yellow River all the way to the Caspian Sea, the largest continuous land empire in the history of the world. The most remarkable result of this Mongol conquest is that East is open to West for the first time in a thousand years. Pax Mongolica, a Mongol peace, allowed people for the first time to travel in absolute safety from Rome to Beijing. That was never possible before, and it wasn't possible until the 20th century afterwards. It's not a small thing. We had people from the Middle East traveling all over, all the way even into China. A uh, famous traveler, Ibn Battuta from Morocco, eventually reached, at least he says he reached, uh, China uh, and traveled through much of the successor states of the Mongols, uh, Mongol states ruled by the descendants of Genghis Khan. And that created a kind of knowledge of uh, the knowledge, each civilization in Eurasia acquiring more knowledge about each other. Ironically, creating such an empire is not Genghis Khan's goal. The flame of vengeance still burns in his belly, and he still has a score to settle with the Chinese. To that end, he now turns, but it is the one thing beyond his reach. In 1227, in his mid-60s, Genghis Khan dies on the march to China. According to legend, the victim of a freak riding accident. Armed troops and slave girls escort his body back to the steps, where he is laid to rest in secrecy. There are various stories about uh, 50 guards were detailed to bury him. They were killed by 50 others who were then killed, in turn killed by, by other people, so that the grave would, would, would remain secret for various reasons. Um, but as for the precise location of this, we don't know. The, the way that the Mongol chieftains were buried was in total secrecy. They went off on a procession, the people who were going to bury them, blaring horns, beating drums, making as much noise as possible. And if anybody met the procession on its route to its secret destination where the person was going to be buried, they were, they were killed. So the whole point was that nobody should know where the great ones of the Mongols were buried. Not a single tomb of a Mongol chieftain has ever been excavated, if not been found. So we have no idea what they contain. Genghis Khan's empire seems to be as lost as his mountain grave, for upon his death, the state he sought to unify breaks apart carved up into four kingdoms for his four sons. But the dream lives on. It will turn into a nightmare in the hands of another Mongol conqueror. Driven by visions of glory, he will unleash a reign of terror even bloodier and more brutal than Genghis Khan's. In an eruption of violent conquest, the Mongolian Empire continues to expand after Genghis Khan's death in 1227. In the west, the Golden Horde, descendants of Genghis Khan, rules southern Russia and Khwarazm. In the far east, the Khan's grandson defeats and unites the three kingdoms of China. And in Persia, the Mongols convert to Islam, building fabulous mosques to glorify their new god. Still, as successful as the Mongolian Empire may be, its huge size makes it difficult to maintain. There weren't enough Mongols. 
This was not a gigantic nation. It wasn't like China, for example. Perhaps there were as many as a hundred thousand people in the Mongol army, and that was about it. So the wider the territories they controlled, the thinner the crust of Mongol dominion on them. By the mid 14th century, Genghis Khan's empire lies in shambles. Like the old Mongol clans of the steppes, the rulers spend their time fighting each other instead of combining their strength. The actual power was slipping from the hands of the Genghis Khan, the descendants of Genghis Khan, and falling into the hands of these tribal warlords, people who were not themselves of the imperial family, but who were the real holders of power. In the middle of the 1300s, in the Muslim lands of Khwarazm, in modern-day Uzbekistan, a young Mongol boy named Timur prepares to steal his neighbor's sheep. He is a clever and stealthy adversary to the shepherd, but this time, his luck will fail him. It is said that he receives a wound that never fully heals, making him lame for life. As he grows to power, he is called Timur the Lame, or Tamerlane in the West. It is a name that his enemies will come to dread. By the year 1360, Timur is an important emir, or leader, a master chess player, a skilled strategist. Though he is a Mongol, he cannot claim descent from Genghis Khan, so he creates an elaborate genealogy linking himself to the great leader. He even takes two wives descended from Genghis Khan to legitimize his claim. Timur certainly, I think, saw himself as a restoring a certain view, a certain version of Genghis Khan history. It was his own version. It reflected very much the prism of his own ambitions. And um, he, at a certain point, saw himself as a man of destiny, not only as simply the agent of, of the, uh, the righteousness of the Genghis Khan and cause, but saw himself as a person acting in, in his own right. By 1375, the Mongol Empire is not Timur's only restoration project. A century and a half after Genghis Khan put Samarkand to the torch, Timur hopes to make his adopted hometown the jewel of the world. He was born in that very area, and he was always attached to uh, what is now Uzbekistan as his birthplace. And in the course of his campaigns, wherever he went, he would kill all the men in a city that he had captured, but he would save all the artisans from death and transport them back to Samarkand. So you must imagine Samarkand alive with traditions from all over the Muslim world, from China, also from India. So Samarkand was something special. Samarkand was a garden city and one of Timur's um, main construction activities was to provide irrigation canals that opened up whole suburbs with these wonderful gardens. Because Timur was a Muslim, he also constructed Muslim buildings. And he used a lot of the booty that he acquired when he conquered India to construct an absolutely enormous mosque. One of the attributes of Timur seems to have been his pride and his megalomania, we might say, and you see this in this mosque. It is colossal. Size was the big thing. The, the entrance way is 50 feet tall, and clearly the impression you're supposed to get is I, the humble little worshiper, have to go through this 50-foot doorway to get in. The magnificence of Samarkand is a testament to the might of Timur, but it is also a testament to his brutal means of keeping order. Inside the walls of Samarkand, his merciless cruelty becomes legend. From 1385 on, Timur systematically sacks all of western Persia, as well as cities throughout Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, and the Caucasus. Tens of thousands of people are slain along the way. In 1398, 
Timur follows in the footsteps of the Greeks, leading an audacious expedition over the world's most notorious mountains, the Hindu Kush. He then lays waste to northern India. But the farther Timur extends his reach, the more difficult it is to control hostile populations. When the inhabitants of Delhi rebel against their new Mongol masters, Timur takes a page out of Genghis Khan's Book of Terror and writes a new and even more horrific chapter. The reports that he cut off the heads of his victims and piled them into huge heaps occur so often that one can't help wondering whether this is not accurate and not just mere rhetoric, but it, it wouldn't account for the numbers, 70,000, 80,000. I think we're talking about psychological warfare, which is something that the Mongols had introduced. It's one thing to go to war. It's quite another to use terror as a weapon of war. And this is what Timur did. Timur built upon the legacy of Chinggis and used it effectively. He was more terrible in that sense that he slaughtered more brutally, more quickly, uh, but always, always sparing the artisans. When they say he destroyed the city, that's uh, somewhat of a metaphor, meaning he killed off enough people to look at bad, to make it look bad, and then he brought back from every city he conquers the best workers, the best artisans, uh, the best engineers, the best products. The vaulted skyline of modern-day Istanbul bears testament to the one dynasty that stood in the way of Timur's dream of a Genghis-sized empire, the Ottoman Turks. In 1402, Timur's expanding lands reached the immovable borders of Ottoman Sultan Bayezid. Proud to the point of arrogance, neither leader can tolerate the other. Timur even goes so far as to suggest Bayezid's mother is of dubious birth, meaning she is a whore. Bayezid can stand no more. Leading one of the finest armies in the world, the Sultan rides out of his fortress at Ankara to meet Timur's far smaller force. Confident and imposing, he knows little of the cunning genius of the Mongol Timur. In 1402, goaded by slurs on his honor, the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid races to meet Timur's Mongol forces. But Timur, aware of the Sultan's route, does an end sweep around the Turks. Traveling off the beaten track, he catches the Sultan off guard. He lays siege to the Turkish stronghold Ankara itself. It is a humiliating turn of events for Bayezid. He is forced to beat a hasty retreat to defend his city. When his weary troops finally arrive, they are no match for the well-rested Mongols. Even worse, in the heat of battle, an entire Turkish battalion defects to the Mongol side when they see a beloved prince fighting for Timur. Tricked, betrayed, and totally routed, Sultan Bayezid nobly refuses to leave the field of battle. He is determined to fight to the last, but he is captured and taken prisoner. The Ottoman defeat may taste sweet to Timur, but it is even more delicious to Christian Europe. Now, if you look at this on the grand strategic map, of Eurasia at the time, the Ottoman sultans were poised to scoop up Constantinople. They had moved into Europe, they had encircled it, they were ready to begin the siege that would have destroyed the principal city of Eastern Christendom. And just then, that was their bad luck. Someone came knocking at their back door, and that was Timur. The reaction, uh, in Europe to the defeat of, of Bayezid Yildirim was unrestrained joy.
With the defeat of the Ottomans in 1402, Timur's empire nearly matches Genghis Khan's in size and scope. Predictably, it is not enough for the voracious conqueror. To secure his place in history, he must do his hero one better. And the only way to accomplish this is to take what Genghis could not, China. But like Genghis Khan, Timur mysteriously falls ill and dies on the march to China. In 1405, in Samarkand, he is laid to rest in a tomb as ornate as Genghis Khan's was simple. There's a curious story that as he lay dying, he said, do not disturb my grave, for if you do, a fate worse than me will fall upon you. And his grave was kept absolutely untouched until the 22nd of June, 1941, when Soviet archeologists opened the grave and found the skeleton of a tall man with a damaged hip. And on the 22nd of June, 1941, Hitler launched his attack on Russia. And that was the signal for some 20 million Russians to perish in the following four years. So you could say that he had a long arm and that that long arm stretched right into the 20th century. Without the force of Timur's personality and leadership, his heirs are unable to hold the empire together. The Mongols begin to fade into history. Too small in number to rule their vast empire, they become assimilated into the cultures they conquer, adopting their religions and customs as their own. And yet, their impact remains immeasurable even today. By opening China to the West, the Mongols created an insatiable thirst for Asian goods. The drive to quench it spurred the age of discovery and the voyages that would lead Europe to America. Truly, by shattering the old empires of China and Persia, the Mongols gave birth to the modern world. An empire that stretched from the Sea of Japan to the Baltic, from uh, Korea to East Germany. And took in most of Eurasia, apart from India and Southeast Asia. There's been nothing like it. Will the world ever see another empire like it? In Mongolia, some fervently hope so. Even today, Genghis Khan is worshipped there as a god. His name is a source of national pride, his tent a hallowed shrine. Small wonder, then, that the Mongols wait eagerly for the spirit to rise anew and for the barbarian to return.